Okay, good morning, afternoon, every, uh, evening, everybody. And thanks so much for joining us um, here today on this uh, interesting webinar for proactive protection. We've still got some people um, joining us. So just to let you know sort of how the session will be run, um, there's no chat function, um, but there is going to be time for Q&A throughout the session and some discussion. So please do put your questions in the chat. Uh, and if they're for specific panellists, please do indicate who they're for. I think we'll get started because we've got a really packed agenda um, and some some excellent panellists with us here today. Um, so as, as, as you will have seen, um, this webinar focuses on approaches to prevent, reduce or mitigate the impact of violence, um, noting that while efforts to interrupt violence should be at the forefront of humanitarian action, the value of this approach is often underutilized and underprioritized within the humanitarian sector. So this session uh, aims to bring together organizations and individuals using approaches to reduce violence, giving concrete examples, um, including from affected country concepts texts and inspiring stories of success. Um, as I say, we've got an excellent range of panellists here with us today with representatives from Nonviolent Peace Force, Norwegian Refugee Council, Community in Need Aid in South Sudan, Right to Protection in Ukraine, humanitarian, Humanity and Inclusion from Colombia. So without taking up any more time, let me hand over to Tiffany Easton, the Executive Director of Nonviolent Peace Force. Over to you, Tiffany. Thank you so much, Gemma, and hello, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. Thanks to the Global Protection Cluster for hosting this event, for NRC for really leading on the organization, all the panelists and everybody who is able to join in uh, with us today. Uh, it's it's really and, and and energizing to be able to be part of this conversation as the a, a vibrant developing emerging part of the protection community uh, that we see has really got a lot of traction and that's really helping us overall shift our focus from uh, looking at protection as largely a, a remedial response to really including a, a, a focus and an energy around the prevention of violence. Protection's really come a long way in the humanitarian sector over the last few years. It's not so long ago that we often got asked by leaders in the humanitarian community, members of humanitarian country teams and such, uh, what is protection? I don't understand what this is even about. Uh, and, and to where we saw the funding for protection was just slivers, drops in the bucket compared to other sectors. So we have seen a real shift. And that's really come as sort of as we've sort of across the board really recognized recognize that those numbers out there are staggering. Uh, you know, we see numbers uh, that talk about 2 billion plus people living in conflict affected countries, more than 80 million having had to flee, forcibly leaving their homes because of violent conflict. Violence being the leading, leading cause of death in certain age groups, 15 to 44 is one of the reports that's out there. Violence plays a big part of it. And from a humanitarian perspective, with numbers like that, the odds are doesn't there will never be enough remedial action to even come close to meeting those needs. And there's a collective and awareness that we could use the organizations, the structures, the influence that we have, and the, the, the physical, the human resources that we have on the ground to actually contribute towards preventing violence. I think historically, we've often felt quite um, almost hypnotized or paralyzed by the complexity of violent conflict and had a collective feeling, well, if we we can't we need to be humble we can't make claims that we can end a conflict we can't bring all of the conflict to an end so we should be very careful about what we say about prevention and really shied away from that we also have been really uh, careful about engagement with people who do represent the threats which are generally armed actors state or or non-state and we really thought what does that mean for humanitarian principles and neutrality and largely been focusing on people's vulnerabilities and building capacity and not really engaging on direct threat reduction so historically but there is a convergence now where through work being done and we'll hear a lot about that today, specific examples where we're, we're seeing more and more that 
the work being done in country programs in in where in conflict affected areas done by all teams people from all parts of the world whether from the communities that are directly directly affected or those um who come in and and support from outside that really is able to work on interrupting violence interrupting in the moment so when we talk about proactive presence it's helping us really shift our focus to look at the prevention of, of violence and again not writ large prevention of violence but really looking at for those moments of interventions where where the interruption of, of violence where an individual a family a community is being threatened or of, for direct physical harm if we can support the opportunity and support changing the outcome and increasing their safety and security what really what we can we can be contributing to violence that moves forward into the next week the next month the next generation as it builds up in terms of things like revenge uh ongoing untreated trauma when people are impacted by violence so there's a real imperative to be able to do that um and what we are looking at with proactive presence comes from a you know a, a body of work that largely sat in the idea that internationals um could really play a a, a a deterrent role because they were representatives of the international community and while some of that is built into this type of work uh still today that sort of old idea of passport protection has gone by the wayside and what we really see is proactive presence or strategic or protective presence um, for violence reduction is really about inclusivity. It's an approach to violence reduction that it really looks at these asymmetrical power relationships and seeing those who the, the small group of people hold most of the power are able to normalize threats of violence or the use of violence. Uh, and for the, those who have the least amount of power are are most are the victims of violence or being most impacted and the work we collectively do as as an integrated group community of people in, directly impacted by violence and those who come in to support can actually directly engage to change the outcome of threats of violence we're working on delinking our connection between physical protection as being the requirement that sort of automatic assumption that we need the a, a force or the threat of force to be present to protect um, and to and to stop physical violence. There is no singular answer to these complex world we're places that we're, we're all trying to work and contribute to. Uh, there are times and places for each of those responses, but what we all know, and I'm sure people on this call uh, from their own lived experiences, is the headline violence, the forces fighting forces, is just one small part of what we see as violence that permeates throughout society, particularly in protracted crisis, protracted conflict, where we see violence sort of really starting to get normalized and permeate all aspects of society. And so when we think about the role that we can play of interrupting cycles of violence in the homes, in small communities, in schools, inter and intra communal violence, that all of that is the building block to a more sustainable approach of a larger approach to 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 ending broader conflict. So if we each are able to build up skills and play our roles in those area, uh, those areas, uh, then uh, we have a better chance of sort of not just being in the remedial service. The overarching of this goal of this work, of course, is to do the right thing in the moment. You know, if any one of us were were at, at immediate threat of being harmed, we would hope somebody would intervene and help keep us safe in that moment. So that humanitarian imperative of doing the right, the, doing the right thing in the moment. We have an opportunity as a community, in addition to that, is to really challenge and contribute towards a larger paradigm shift. If we can demonstrate through the work that you'll hear about today, that it is possible for unarmed civilian-led strategies to make a significant difference in the outcomes related to violence or threat of violence, we can help contribute to those who are in the policy uh, field, those who are making funding decisions about how to approach and how to how to do things like conflict prevention, conflict management, and overall civilian protection from broadening up and and moving past the again the overprivileging of resourcing force protection as the sort of most trusted and known approach to to deal with that. We can contribute over the last few years. We've seen there's been 27 or so UN and UN related policies, recommendations and reckon, resolutions, including mission mandates that are now putting in the language of unarmed approaches for protection of civilian as priorities. 
for four years in a row. Um, the US Congress's annual funding bill has called for advancing unarmed civilian protection as an approach. In the recent years, more than 15 country missions to the UN in New York have hosted events featuring this kind of work, unarmed civilian-led strategies to violence reduction. So we've got some momentum out there. We've got a community really in development, and we're learning from each other, and we can be inspired by each other. And we've still got a lot. We've got more work to do, and more more ways that we can spill, skill up. So really, today we're hoping to come together, be inspired, hear examples of of what's happening, uh, and and then to inspire us all. And, and to be able to move forward. So, so let me end there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And Gemma, let me hand it back over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Tiffany. And I think it's just so important to think about those sort of long-term approaches, inclusive approaches, and as you say, that paradigm shift. So I really hope this conversation here um, can contribute, contribute to that. So let me just hand straight over to uh, Carolina Francaschini um, from NRC, who will present on uh, NRC's Civilian Self-Protection Programme, an example from Afghanistan. Over to you, Carolina. Thank you very much, Gemma, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very pleased to start and uh, to be presenting you today one example from our civilian self-protection work in Afghanistan. Um, as NSC, we have started to implement the civilian self-protection program since around 2016 um, because we strongly believe that efforts to interrupt the violence should be at the forefront of the protections of civilians. Um, achieving greater protection outcomes require humanitarian actors to move close to the front line. And to do so in NSC, we have developed this strong civilian self-protection program, which mainly focuses on civilian agency, and it really aims at strengthening existing positive self-protection capacities in armed conflict and other situations of violence com context. So we know that communities and individuals develop self-protection strategies to respond to conflict and violence. This is because they know their context and what they need to feel safer, better than anyone else. And by supporting them to collectively identify and strengthen these strategies, affected person and communities can reduce protection risks and mitigate the humanitarian consequences of violence. Of course, in addition to supporting all these self-protection strategies that exist at community level, we also, as humanitarian actor, bring protection tools uh, that are developed by humanitarian actors through, for example, they work um, with communities and through, for example, conflict re resolution and research. And thanks to these tools, communities and individuals are able to expand their their capacities, their skills for self-protection, and can really build a better resilience to address and respond to protection threats. So I would like to share with you a more concrete example from how our civilian self-protection work in Afghanistan. Um, in Afghanistan, um, the way we work is that we start by identifying communities for the CSP program, and usually this is based on uh, some criteria, such as, for example, proximity to conflict activity, community acceptance of the program, but also presence of conflict-related protection risk within the community. Once we select the communities, we then identify existing protection committees, protection group, and we take them through a civilian self-protection training and during the training we give the opportunity to the protection committees to identify all the conflict related risks within their community alongside with other components from the protection risk equation once we have the committees identify these potential mitigation measures we then identify person responsible for a protection risk reduction plan and after the training we ensure that we continue to mentor and engage with the communities through for example other forms of support and this form of support can can be like provision of material aid or additional training depending on the action plan so in the north of afghanistan uh, 
especially in the province of Kunduz and, and Balk, we have implemented a mood year CSP program. Um, the both provinces we were working in were experiencing frontline conflict with a lot of fluctuations in the lines of control. And the fluctuating front lines resulted in displacement for most of the communities, which was a core focus of our, our protection program, but also opened communities to targeting by armed groups, both directly and indirectly. So um, while talking to communities and engaging with them, the communities reported high level of heavy weaponry being used within civilian spaces, human rights abuse from by armed actors, contamination, occupation of civilian infrastructure. So the program really concentrated on this particular concern. So during the program, we worked in one of the village and we worked with Mr. Amadi, who was a 50 years old um, NRC Protection Committee member who received uh, CSP training in 2021 together with other community members. In early 2022, the commander of the local police moved into Mr. Amadi village with several armed bodyguards, armed vehicles and assorted weaponry. So the community was concerned about having a militarized home within a civilian neighborhood. So the community expressed their concern to Mr. Amadi, who decided to convene a protection committee meeting to basically discuss the risk and went through a list of possible solutions together with the other committee's member. He then led uh, the committee in approaching the police commander and he explained to the police commander that their, their village was a civilian space and that is present with weapons and uniforms opening up the village of being targeted. So Mr. Amadi presented the commander with options the protection committee had considered. So either dismiss the armed guards and store weaponry at the police station or relocate to an area with fewer civilians. So the commander agreed to disarm after recognizing this unified stance of the community and the political pressure that was leveraged by the community through advocacy with relevant stakeholders. So the commanders also uh, expressed surprise that the protection committee, they knew the distinctions between civilians and combatant and was able to use this knowledge to reduce the risk of being targeted. Um, so Mr. Amadi told the NRC that the protection committee had built on other committees within the community and with the CSP training and the terms of reference, the committee role and status was solidified. So they started to do conflict mediation, prevention work, as it now the committee is included in the formal justice system and the governance mechanism of the village. And now the committee currently meets on an average of twice a month and they have new members joining from different age groups. So this story for us, um, it is important because it really shows how the self-protection strategies chosen and implemented by a community in the case of uh, this case study, mainly advocacy towards armed actors and exercising collective influence have a concretely helped to prevent further violence. Um, it's also a prime example of civilian agency as it demonstrates how civilian, by applying civilian self-protection tools, can really create a space to keep their family safe in the midst of a conflict. And despite a volatile context, the participants to the training really demonstrated their ability to maintain their own civilian status and neutrality, really driving action and advocacy through the committees during the conflict and really they defended their neutrality through basically their own association and their own self-protection uh, structures and, and mechanism. And they were also able to navigate difficult conversation and had made advocacy efforts with armed groups and recognized that their action increased the safety of the of the community. So, of course, we acknowledge uh, that CSP strategies alone might not provide the level of protection that communities need. However, we feel that as protection actors, we have a role to play in continuing investing in strengthening local capacities for self-protection, supporting existing community strategies, and really promoting community-led action 
as they do contribute to prevent and reduce protection risks. During um, a reflection and community workshop, we had the opportunity to confront some of the communities we work with um, and confront them on the program. And we have heard communities saying that the program helped them to increase their safety, facilitate life-saving action, and really provide a mandate for collective action. Uh, we are therefore very excited to, to continue uh, this work. However, we also need to be very cognizant that there is still a lot that we need to do in terms of uh, growing and expanding this work. And there is still a need for a lot of learning that we need to do on what is working, what is not working. So we are convinced that this work is critical, is a critical area uh, to work on. And we really look for support from, from donors to be willing to be with us in, in, the, in this effort and really support through funding on evaluation and learning on these proactive protection approaches. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carolina. And I think it's um, I think that's a really powerful example of sort of looking at where there's external support to existing community mechanisms, as you say, sort of working through the agency of communities, building skills capacities. But that even when those uh, interventions have ended, you know, the tangible impact that that can have on the lives of affected people, I think it's a really powerful example. And going back to what Tiffany said on sort of looking at sort of rather than being overwhelmed but the sort of smaller outcomes these these smaller outcomes are incredibly important outcomes so i think that's a very powerful example thank you carolina for sharing um so now we'll go ahead and move over to south sudan so we have daniel duankalai with us from community in need aid um and daniel's going to share lessons from a range of proactive protection activities that that uh, that Sina, along with the other organisations, implement in South Sudan. So, Daniel, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gemma, and and thank you, everyone. Good evening to you. Good morning, wherever you are, and good afternoon. As I introduce, this is Daniel Duom from Community Need Aid, uh, South Sudan, known as Sina. And, and we really appreciate to be part of this webinar and we thank uh, the Global Protection Cluster and the NRC, the Nonviolent uh, uh, Peace Force and the other partners for organizing this event. So we are so grateful to share from South Sudan uh, about uh, proactive protection strategies, activities uh, being done, both that are done by uh, Sina and the partners, and also by the communities themselves. Next. And this particular are the example from South Sudan who would, uh, wants to present these four examples and for the purposes of stimulating discussions on this webinar. The first one is humanitarian negotiations on the mobilizations and release of abductees, especially children and women. And also the second one is violence reduction and disescalation strategies. Third one is creation of an armed spaces or humanitarian corridors and access to services for survivors of violence. And lastly, the community self-protection skills. And we want to appreciate the NRC for pre presenting some aspects that uh, relates to our examples. And this one will also build on those examples that are also shared and given. So let's look at these particular examples uh, briefly. Next. So the first one, which is the humanitarian negotiation on demobilization and release of abductees, is one of the examples we have. And all these examples that we have given, some of them are uh, uh, tended and they actually uh, leads to the interruption to violence, and some are preventive measures to violence, and some share the same uh, examples of uh, either preventing uh, violence or uh, interrupts or break the chains of violence where it has a cut. So the first one is the humanitarian negotiations, as I mentioned earlier on, on demobilization and release of abductees, uh, and this has been particularly uh, implemented by Sina and other partners, such as Save the Children, Gredo, and Kyle. 
this particular one happened uh, in between the clashes, intercommunal clashes between the communities, that is to say in South Sudan, uh, the Nuer community, uh, the Nkabur community, and, 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 and Murle community. There have been intercommunal violence and that led to abduction of children and also women. But Sina and the partners came in under the uh, RSRTF, Reconciliation, Stability, Resilience for Trust Funds. This was a joint uh, intervention. And, and through engaging these communities, uh, trying to demobilize the tensions, there was an agreement to bring to the, to the forefront that uh, women and children that were abducted were released, about 100 and, 102 uh, women and children were released from Yongle State and handed over to the Greater Pibor administrative area. And that led to uh, a relative peace because the chains of violence was broken. But however, there were uh, challenges registered, such as a lack of trust among the communities. There were also insufficient funds and fragile political atmosphere. Uh, and then the poor infrastructure, roads and community and but also natural disaster that, that hit the country, such as flooding that affected the, the implementation of these projects. But this particular one was shipped and, and then the community uh, uh, were at peace. Next. Similar to the first one is the violent reduction and escalation uh, strategies. Uh, that happened and, and then also was particularly almost the same part of, of, of children being released and returned. But the whole idea because of this conflict was now between these two communities of, uh, of Greater Pibor administrative area and also Bor County. And because of this conflict, the same way there were also children abducted and also cattle raided from these communities. But through using these strategies, uh, to diffuse the tensions and the risk of escalations, which was coordinated by the state governments. Other than that was coordinated by, uh, by, by, by the humanitarian agencies. This one was actually laid by, by the government. That led to the release now of uh, 80 abductees and also cattle from uh, uh, jungle states to greater people administrative area. And for this case, uh, peace was realized, but not only peace, but also the violence was disescalated and also reduced and, and interrupted the chain that would have happened in case of initiation from the other community. This one put them at rest. And these particular things, there are also example of such uh, community uh, uh, violence happening, such as one of the example is that because of the, the natural disaster that have hit uh, mostly up an region in South Sudan, the cattle herders are moved to, to the agrarian communities, but because there is a uh, clash between these communities, it has led to untold uh, atrocities. But this could have been contained if, if, if uh, proactive uh, protection strategies uh, were applied. I hope this one would have been uh, mitigated and the situation contained, but unfortunately, uh, it wasn't done. Next. So the third uh, example that Sina is presenting is creation of an armed species and humanitarian corridors. This particular aspect is being uh, used by the communities and also supported by the partners. But this has existed in the centuries between the communities having realized that, as, as our colleague from NRC put it, that developed some protection strategies. But the whole idea is this, uh, about this, that communities themselves staying together, being close to each other, try to create uh, uh, humanitarian spaces in case of conflict. And the example of this are, are, are two. One is between the community of Nuer, one of the tribes in South Sudan, and the community of, of, of Dinka Bor, part of a greater Dinka uh, ethnic community, have been living together as neighbors. But because of intercommunal violence and also migration, some of uh, Nuer community, for example, Law Nuer, came to settle on, on, on the area of uh, Dinka Bor. Uh, especially in Duke uh, uh, County. But now the, 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 the conflict broke out in these communities and then the Nuer, Gower, and Law raided uh, the community, the Dinka Board community, and took the cattle. 
you could see now the situation that the community want also to retaliate. But now some of the leaders and some of the community members created this uh, humanitarian uh, uh, and army space and said, no, you can't do this to them. So what we need is to create for them a safety and to protect them. And these people were protected. They live within the community until it was safe for them to live to their community, the other side. And also likewise, uh, because uh, of the means of survival being, being destroyed, the community from being Gabor now moved to the side of, 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 of Nuer, who actually fought with them. But they were also hosted and lived together until relative uh, peace was attained, and then they returned to their community. So you could see now the community themselves applying these strategies by themselves and helping uh, to create these spaces. Also, it happened recently between uh, uh, the community of Bor and also Murile because of the intercommunal clutches. The Murile also, who were also uh, uh, involved in this conflict, moved and came to, to Dinkabor, those who actually fought with them. But they believed and trusted that they could get safety. And actually, they were hosted. And of course, the, the whole chain of violence now was broken and delayed foundation for humanitarian intervention and peace building initiatives being taken. Next. Next. Lastly, is, is I'll go back to the, to the other slides before. Lastly, the community self-protection uh, skills, and of course, I referred it before that uh, a colleague from uh, NRC also presented from the other perspective of Afghanistan. But this is uh, actually to build the capacity of children and to give them skills, children and women, in case of uh, abduction and sexual violence, they will be able to, to protect themselves and be able to prevent uh, violence when they are approached by perpetrators. But this is also loaded, it is both also uh, preventive and also interactive in case of uh, violence occurring. What these skills include teaching them on uh, games such as stick and hide for children and adolescents, but also for karate for adolescents and women, and, and also danger signs being, be, being given to them. Particularly, this, these skills were actually uh, given by enemies in South Sudan, especially in Malakal, and helping them uh, to be able to build their capacity, be able to defend themselves against aggressors and also against any physical assault and other forms of violence against vulnerable people. So these particular uh, measures uh, help prevent it, uh, the violence and they were able also to broke the chains of, of violence that happened in South Sudan. We believe there are more examples that should have been given. We also believe that this could also be as found as further, but we, we, we gave this few examples only to stimulate the discussion for this particular uh, webinar and, and for the case of uh, helping to see that these particular strategies and, uh, and, and activities are being done by other partners, also by the government, and also by the community themselves. But there's still room to, to build on this and to help the community uh, being in safe and being uh, at, the, at, the, at the protection. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, over to you, Gemma. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and I think I think you put some really interesting uh, range of examples there, including sort of the the um, risk of not intervening. And I think sometimes organisations don't fully think through, sometimes think through the risks of intervening, but not necessarily of not. So thanks for pointing that out. And I think also really interesting points around the need to build trust um, and that some of the pitfalls if that trust is not there. But, you know, also those examples you gave of building trust between communities that have previously um, be, uh, been in conflict and and building some kind of cohesion. Um, for for um, participants and listeners, we're going to, um, after our next panellist, um, we'll go into our first Q&A. We're splitting it because we've got a very full agenda. Um, so please do start posting your questions in the chat uh, and we'll stop after the next intervention. Um, but so for the next intervention, we've got Huibet Oldenres. I probably haven't pronounced that terribly. Huibet, sorry about that. Um, or Global Head of Programming from Nonviolent Peace Wars. So over to you. Thank you, Gemma. Can you see the screen? 
Yes, yep. great, wonderful. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about different types of intervention that we have uh, um, experimented with, uh, applied in different contexts, rather than going very deeply into one specific example of, uh, of proactive protection. Um, I want to start off with an example from South Sudan, so really a classic example of proactive protection. Uh, often around IDP sites, um, refugee sites, where mostly women go out to find uh, find water, find uh, firewood, um, and putting themselves at risk, uh, moving to different checkpoints, facing sexual harassment, sometimes at every checkpoint. Um, and so what we do is to 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 go physically walk with them to to places where they find themselves uh, unsafe. And we're not sort of going off the fly, but we're really kind of looking at with them which which are the areas that people feel most insecure. We are going out before we go with with the, those groups to engage with the soldiers at checkpoints to know that that they know who we are, um, so that they also uh, know that we're coming with them. And we find that a lot of the times uh, uh, those groups are not very comfortable with committing those violations in front of a big group, uh, let alone with, uh, with international organizations. Where often local groups are taking over these activities, like women protection teams that are forming and that are then are taking over these, these uh, accompanied by themselves, although we, we are phasing out our presence from that. We may also sort of engage with local commanders in this example to say, OK, maybe a local commander is willing to leverage on this issue. What can he do to reduce kind of harassment uh, by drunken soldiers uh, to which refugees are were going out? And interestingly, also uh, in some places like in Darfur, uh, when we go out into an area where, this, where we are meal, um, sometimes the, the, uh, the community accompanies us. And so there is a symbiotic relationship between this, this accompaniment. It's not just NP accompanying um, local communities, but sometimes local communities accompanying us. And so that is part of that process. Um, we have applied this kind of work of, of providing presence or accompaniment in different types of spaces, whether it is on, I mean, on human rights trials where witnesses need to testify but are afraid of, of, of being harassed. Um, and sometimes there is an aspect of solidarity involved rather than kind of a real threat. Um, we've provided, for example, presence at demonstrations in the United States where people felt uh, being harassed either by, by uh, police officers or by um, uh, bystanders. Um, an interesting case also in, in, in Iraq where um, we found that a lot of humanitarian aid workers were going away at night and, and violence were actually more uh, uh, frequent during the night time. So we, we started our team there, started to do night patrols in, in specific areas of, of, of the IDP sites where people felt unsafe. Um, at some point, I remember the um, uh, a wash actor uh, discovered an, an, an ISIS tunnel um, and that immediately drew a kind of a, a force protection uh, to go there, military or, or a police officer were immediately stations around those tunnels in the camp. And we already could see that that would be a pull for, uh, for more harassment uh, towards civilians. So you can often see that coming. And so our team started engaging with those soldiers, starting to have a presence there to anticipate any kind of harassment by sort of those forces towards, towards refugees. Um, another kind of example is sort of holding that space within sort of community disputes. And you see on the picture here is an example from, from Sri Lanka where the communities are engaging with each other. We're not the mediators here in this space, but sometimes communities feel unsafe to come together. Uh, and so uh, if NP is present and we do a lot of groundwork, uh, working with one community, working with the other community to bring them together and sometimes to follow up on if someone is 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 um, violating the agreements, bring them back together and monitoring that space. So that is a kind of a, a different type of, of presence in a more kind of a peace building setting. And sometimes that is applied with, uh, with IDPs and host communities as well. Uh, just a quick slide on, 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 on theory. We've seen a lot of the times that humanitarians focusing on sort of civilians that have been affected by uh, perpetrators and, and while human rights advocates focusing a lot on putting pressure on the decision makers. Whereas the whole space, the chain of command is often 
a big smoke screen around who is doing the actual violence. And so what we found as NP that was useful is to engage with different the parts of the chain of command so to really see where is the violence coming from um, and also acknowledging that that there are people within the chain of command that are willing to leverage with us that are willing to collaborate it's not one block of perpetrators um, who are committing those violations um, a different kind of example is around ceasefire monitoring where we also brought in sort of a proactive approach to monitoring, not just going in and reporting violations and bringing them back um, when incidents happen, which is often the case, but really seeing what are the areas where there are tensions. Oftentimes we notice that soldiers on the ground don't know the ceasefire agreements. They they act on, on what they think is best um, and create create uh, uh, escalations through that through that way. And so often at the times it's like clarification, anticipating where escalations may happen, uh, rumors that may sort of be acted upon by, by one group or another that lead communities to displace, and sort of really anticipating a lot of that work, especially in post-conflict situations where parties are not willing to, uh, to, to communicate or don't trust each other at all. Um, and oftentimes, like Tiffany talked about, like the violence is sometimes so overwhelming. Um, and so we really try sometimes to 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 stay within uh, a feasible uh, way of of uh, of not overstepping our boundaries. Um, in this case, in Myanmar and the Philippines, we saw a lot of of people being caught in crossfires, and we're not here to say to the soldiers, "You got to stop the fighting." We're not addressing the violence. We're here really staying focused on can we get the civilians out of harm's way. And sometimes they're very willing to leverage with us and say, I give you a half an hour, the other one's also stopping. So we go to leverage with the other side and they say, yes, okay, we'll give you a half an hour, fine, get the people out. And sometimes those parties are really happy that you're doing that because they don't want to harm civilians that create a uh, negative uh, um, image for them. And so there is often space um, for us to leverage on, on, on these kind of things. Um, early warning is also an, an example that I want to mention, especially in places where uh, communities feel really abandoned and violence is so much that we're really saying we cannot stop it, communities cannot stop it. But there are things that we can do to organize ourselves. Uh, if children knows what to do when uh, the next attack happens, um, where they need to go to if they are in the school, for example, um, at least maybe not all the children get missed uh, in the next time of, a, of, of, an, of an incident. And so by sort of organizing the space and saying sort of what can we do um, if something happens, we can we can give some empowerment back to the communities that say, okay, it's not all kind of uh, fatalistic. And oftentimes violence comes in cycles and we can anticipate that in the next dry season, then another, another cycle of violence will occur. Um, so interesting conclusion, uh, this work requires a lot of, of relationship building and sometimes that's difficult to explain to donors, like why are you drinking more tea uh, with, with local communities? Um, and But finding those entry points, uh, I was talking on the phone with, uh, with someone from Ukraine team uh, right now and she said, there's so much work to be done in the beginning communities that are wondering, well, why are you showing up here again? Um, but at some point they're getting it and they start trusting you and then the stories of, of violations are pouring out. But it needs a lot of time um, to navigate and sometimes you need a local monk or a local priest who can get you an entry point to, to another actor that, you, that you're trying to engage. Um, I want to leave it here. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gemma. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks for that and some and and really good to see sort of quite a wide range of different interventions that the NP have been doing over the years. Um, and yeah, I think it's uh, I think your point on sort of that lower hanging fruit uh, piece is super interesting. Um, again, going back into where we can, which wins we can have. And I think also I found your uh, diagram super interesting. And I wonder if those on the call want to have a little bit of a think around sort of where they see themselves positioning um, themselves as an organization, but equally, you know, what more perhaps uh, they could do. So just as a reminder, we're going to break now and then go back into another round of panelists and Q&A after, but to, to break up for the first Q&A here. So please do 
use the Q&A function if you have any questions. Um, but in the meantime, I'll kick off with a few. So um, I guess sort of I'll, I'll ask this openly and then come round to each panellist for your views on it. So feel free to take which one you think um, resonates mostly with you. But um, I mean, I guess firstly, some people might be wondering what the point is in interrupting violence if we can't stop it from happening again. Um, and can we stop it from happening again? And, and what does that look like in practice and from the experience of, of you and your organisation? Um, maybe some on the... Um, also, how do you mitigate security risks, um, prevention work and violence reduction? Um, obviously inherent is inherent with risks, I'm sure. So how do those that are engaging on that uh, mitigate those risks um, and, and the dangers uh, involved? But I, I guess we probably have quite a broad range of participants on the call of, that are wondering sort of what more they could do within their own organisations in the space. So maybe thinking about sort of what some of the entry points are for humanitarians um, who wish to do a little bit more on proactive prote pro prote protection, looking at prevention, interruption of violence and risk reduction, uh, etc. How do they get, get better at it? Uh, what do they need to think about? So I'll start off with that. But again, a call for those uh, in the audience. Uh, if you want to put out um, any questions, please do so. We've got about 10 minutes for this session, I think. So I'll just go around um from yeah so sort of in the order that we uh that the presenter presented in so carolina uh feel free yeah. to answer whichever of those questions you like <laughs> <laughs> yeah so maybe i can start with what's the point of trying to interrupt violence uh if we can stop it from um, from happening which is uh, i mean a very good and legitimate questions um and i will start by saying that it's it's true we cannot ensure that violence won't happen again. Um, however, and we have heard this from uh, this first round of presentation that in these uh, um, efforts to try to stop and interrupt instances of violence, um, during the process we engage with groups, individuals who can really take um, an active role. Um, they can make choices um, uh, and make commitment and really build on their experience using existing self-protection mechanism and, and, and structure to identify solutions that can prevent or reduce the, the community's exposure to, to threat. And we know that protection is not just about like external approaches, but also civilian approaches to their own uh, self-protection. And if we are able to interrupt violence, even if it's just for a short term of like period of time, we really can help in creating a safer space for communities in which they can talk, for example, about the root causes of conflict. And this can create then space for other type of interventions, such as, for example, peace building to then uh, tackle the root causes and, and try to work more towards um, uh, long term or more sustained um, solution. So, I mean, we know that like um, any method on, on civilian protection, we need to acknowledge that also this program can face challenges and obstacles and not least the lack of funding uh, relative to other form of, for example, externally peace intervention. But it also, these kind of approaches also present like a, an enormous opportunity and possibility and potential for supporting um, civilians' protections and all their efforts in context where without it, like it may not exist at all. So uh, we still feel like um, reducing those instances of violence, if it's just on the short or medium term, is still uh, critical and uh, the work should be focusing on on real prevention. So really try to respond to those immediate threats of violence before they actualize and look up at de-escalating then, then tension um, as part of our uh, protection response. Great, thanks Carolina. 
So Daniel, maybe we can come to you and maybe you want to, I mean, feel free obviously to answer any of the questions, but I know that sort of you've given quite a broad range um, of interventions that, that Sina's involved with in South Sudan. So maybe you could also talk a little bit more about sort of where there are entry points for humanitarians that want to be involved in more uh, protection work and, and what does that look like in the context of South Sudan? What more could be done? Um, yeah, but but obviously sort of feel free to answer any of the three questions I initially pitched. Thanks. Uh, thank you so thank you so much, Gemma, and I really appreciate Kalina for uh, answering the first question. I would like also to look at the, the mostly two questions, maybe the relevancy of this particular uh, concept to the whole uh, uh, world community and particularly to South Sudan. And what more can be done because we have given a wide range of activities and, and then strategies that are already in place and in existence. And somebody could be just asking, uh, why need this? And yet we have other humanitarian interventions already in place. And, 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 and the most important thing that we look at the whole world is engulfed in, in conflict, uh, violence that we see uh, everywhere. And in context of South Sudan, that has been subjected to protracted uh, civil wars. So there are a lot of issues relating to violence. And it would be important that prevention is, is better than cure. So there are now, um, most communities are hostile to each other and then creates a lot of protection risk. But if we apply these strategies, we'll be able to either prevent or interrupt the violence. But where it has interrupted, it creates an humble space. I want to agree with Kalina that there will be a space for humanitarian intervention which could not have happened if, if this chains of violence were not broken and the clashes were it's still happening, but also other activities of peace building may take place. But what more can be done? I believe the law that needs to be done. The existing one needs to be strengthened. That, that needs a lot of the partners and also uh, the donor community, but also to bring this one to the decision makers and especially I want to appeal to the, to the global protection uh, having come up with this, this innovative idea to actually discuss it and put it part of programming, be able to make sure that this is mainstream in all our activity and also equally to the partners. We should actually have a, a, a package or, or an aspect of, of programming that is geared towards uh, employing a proactive uh, protection and then also the donor community should be able to support the partners and should be able to, 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 to give funding for this particular aspect. It, it would be better to prevent than to cure later at, at the later stage. That would also be more expensive, but also to advocate and also create more awareness uh, to, the, to the society so that they're able to adopt or they're able to uh, improve uh, what they had or, and to discover more of proactive uh, strategies that existed but unknown to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the partners and also to the material community. I think a lot of things need to be done and these are some of examples I think could help in the context of South Sudan, a country that is engulfing the whole violence and also where women and children are not safe. Uh, vulnerable people are not safe. Every time you sleep and you know violence may break out, but how do you come out of this? Or when it has occurred, how possible can it be interrupted? These are things that we need to be prepared adequately if these skills are built, the capacities are built, and then there is within the donor community and there is also within the partners and also at the global protection cluster, uh, this agenda to move forward. Over to you, Gemma. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. And I think um, I think it's clear there's always so much be to be done, but then looking at sort of those entry points uh, for for humanitarian organisations. And as you say, um, clearly sort of the prevention is better than cure. Um, we have to we have to think about. Um, Huber, um, I, d I don't know um, if you want to answer one of those specific questions or a couple of them, but I think, you know, it'd be great to hear from you on how Nonviolent peace force works in mitigating security risks, um, but also that that question around entry points for humanitarian organisations. And I think, picking up on your point, um, I you know we hear this a lot as well uh, on, you know, are you just sitting there having cups of tea with people? But actually, that point of sort of 
building trust um, and is there something around the system and we can sort of go into a bit more detail on one of the questions in the chat here as well but wonder if you've got any reflections on the sort of entry point and maybe some of the challenges risks but also opportunities as well as that um, the, the mitigation of risk over to you. Sure, thank you, Jenna. Um, and one point on the on the the, the first question on, on what is the point? I also want to say that in order to, people are so used that violent means are the only way in which you can solve something. And so it is it is incredibly important for us, even from a symbolic uh, perspective, that we can show people that there are different ways to to uh, address violence and that it may work. And then maybe yes, it goes back into into sometimes into another cycle. But enough times we can see that um, to create that momentum and and to build that faith that that there are different ways is really important. And I think that can change through the the cultural war or the, the idea that violent solutions are the only way that we can we can be safe. Um, as for the kind of security risks and and the opportunities at the same time, um, of course. Uh, Ongoing analysis is, is is really key, and and communities we really rely on communities for that. They really know what to do and where to go. Um, I think having our, our for us to be nonpartisan, um, it has been very important for us our security as well, and making sure that we're not only nonpartisan but we're also be perceived as nonpartisan. So that means if we're engaging with one community, we're also engaging with the other community, even if that one, or one community maybe has. As more issues than the other community, we need to sort of make that difference as well, because that helps our security as well. Another another aspect of our security, uh, I think, is to sort of um, to understand what leverage you have. And I think, as I said before, a little bit. Um, oftentimes, I think people start to to put their finger on the on the biggest type of violence, the biggest atrocities, and those are very difficult to to address, and they're very dangerous to address. Um, if you don't have the leverage. And so oftentimes people are ignoring that there's a lot of violence on the periphery that are people in the wrong time, in the wrong place. There's some miscommunications. There's people, uh, people maybe sort of being victims of kind of uh, unruly behavior on, on foot soldiers that commanders don't like to have as well. And so I think starting to sort of tackle those types of violence with a kind of encouragement with those uh, with those soldiers often, with those armed forces and saying, how can we work together rather than right away coming in with like a, a finger pointing. Um, that often builds a lot of trust among those armed forces and armed groups. And they say, hey, we're not the enemy. We're also struggling here. And um, I've been here without a salary for a long time. And I don't know what to do. And I haven't gotten my instructions. And so that, that builds a lot of trust. And that gives us security as well. Um, and knowing what we're doing and the example that I gave before when we're saying, oh, my task here is to get the civilian out. I'm not going to report right now on the human rights violations that I'm seeing because that that may not be the right place. And that may be another, another a task for another organization to tackle or for me at a later stage to tackle. Um, and if I have more leverage and more power and I've been there a longer time with our team in the Philippines, I can see that they are having more leverage and more power to also uh, challenge those armed groups and say, oh, wait a minute, this is really not, not OK. And I can see that because of that trust over a long period of time, um, it's easy for them to sort of to tackle those most sensitive issues. So you should kind of keep that balance of, of your power, your leverage, your trust and so Thanks. Um, and some really interesting points there. I'm not going to try and summarise because we're, uh, we've got some other speakers uh, waiting and we're going a bit beyond time. Thanks also for the questions in the chat. Um, we'll have a look at what we can come back to from the next round of speakers. Um, so now we're uh, introducing Natalia from Right to Protection um, in Ukraine. Um, and looking at um, conflicts and triggers and tensions between IDPs in Ukraine and host communities. Um, so, um, Natalia, over to you. Thanks. Uh, hello to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to present some uh, examples of proactive protection uh, in uh, Ukraine. And firstly, just a few words um, about uh, right to protection. 
And uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, R2P uh, is a human rights um, organization uh, that works uh, to solve uh, problems related to forced displacement and uh, migration. And uh, currently, uh, we are working almost uh, in all uh, regions uh, in Ukraine, uh, controlled uh, by Ukrainian um, government. And we provide assistance uh, to conflict-affected uh, population, and uh, particularly to um, IDPs uh, in Ukraine uh, since um, 2014. Uh, so we um, really understand their challenges and needs, and also uh, we realize those uh, social uh, processes um, that have been taking place uh, in the society after the beginning of uh, war and the way uh, they are transformed afterwards. Uh, so, uh, firstly, um, people really unite in front of um, a common threat. They are ready to uh, help each other uh, 24 um, hours per week. And sometimes uh, they do it on a personal enthusiasm and adrenaline. And uh, then, uh, for obvious reasons, due to constant traumas, exhaustion, lack of um, material, Material resources, uh, insecurity. Uh, so all uh, this leads to the um, the emergence uh, of uh, points of tension and conflicts uh, uh, in uh, communities. Uh, so that's why, and uh, we, we could move to the next slide, please. So uh, that's why uh, last year we uh, conducted um, a research on uh, relationship practice, uh, conflicts, and trigger topics um, among uh, Ukrainian um, IDPs and host communities, as well as returnees and uh, home communities. Uh, next slide, please. Therefore, uh, we wanted to understand uh, what potentially conflicting uh, situation, uh, situations arise or may arise and decide what needs to be done uh, to uh, resolve uh, or um, prevent them. So I'm going to tell more about just uh, several um, cases, several changes, uh, ch challenges, sorry, and uh, conflicts uh, that uh, we um, identified and also about uh, some ways to uh, resolve or uh, interrupt uh, these um, uh, conflicts. Uh, so the first challenge uh, is uh, insecurity. Uh, it's not only about the daily threat to life, uh, physical and mental health uh, that uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, face. It's uh, about the consequences of the action actions of the uh, Russian um, aggressors, uh, namely interruptions in electricity and water supply, uh, an increase in uh, crime in cities and towns, uh, um, a decrease uh, a free access to medical facilities, and also an increase um, in the uh, incidence of HIV, AIDS, TB, other diseases, um, so also presence of weapons, uh, not only among uh, military personnel, but also among uh, civilians, uh, problems with provision of bomb shelters and so on. Um, so, um, what uh, can be done, right, uh, to interrupt or um, prevent these um, problems and some things uh, that uh, could be done uh, are audits of uh, safety in the community and uh, cooperation with law enforcement um, agencies 
and also creation of um, a working groups on security uh, from among employees uh, uh, of local authorities, uh, police officers and uh, public activists. And uh, these working groups uh, may propose some uh, maybe specific plan uh, to resolve issues relevant uh, to their um, own uh, communities. And uh, other challenge and other group of uh, conflict, we could move to other slide. Uh, so uh, this is conflicts of uh, different um, identities. And uh, I could say uh, that this is uh, the most uh, complicated uh, group of conflicts in terms of uh, difficulty to uh, resolve them. Uh, tensions or um, conflicts may arise between people with different values, um, languages, uh, beliefs, rituals, um, traditions. Uh, in addition, uh, the war formed uh, new identities, such as the identities of uh, those who live in the territory where uh, hostilities taking place and those who did not receive such uh, experience, those who were evacuated abroad or to another um, region of Ukraine, and those who moved from the village to, uh, to the city and vice versa. And again, uh, so what could be done uh, to prevent this type uh, of conflicts? Um, we think that it's uh, necessary to organize uh, um, safe spaces uh, for uh, discussion of important and sensitive um, topics in communities. And other activity um, um, is the creation of uh, mobile groups that will uh, consist of a facilitator and uh, psychologist. And these uh, mobile groups will work and help to prevent or uh, resolve uh, different uh, conflicts that uh, may, may appear, for example, in collective centers or during distribution of humanitarian assistance. Uh, and also, I want to uh, present what have done uh, already, and uh, definitely we uh, continue. We will continue with this, this activity. We could move to other slide. Uh, so, based uh, on the results uh, of our research, uh, we have uh, uh, developed and um, implemented uh, a media campaign in which we raise uh, the topic of uh, stigmatization of uh, internally displaced persons. And uh, we wanted to tell that uh, even isolated conflicts, situ conflict situation between IDPs and host communities uh, can affect uh, the collective uh, reputation, uh, stigmatizing all um, IDPs. Um, however, uh, there are many um, stories of uh, mutual help, uh, understanding and uh, compassion. And that is the positive ex experience that gives um, our people a sense of uh, unity. And I want to show you a video uh, that we uh, created in the framework of uh, our uh, media campaign. And with, uh, with this video, uh, we are um, reaching out to IDPs and representatives of uh, host communities to remind them that only by uh, coming together can we uh, survive uh, these difficult uh, times, uh, times for us. And the um, IDPs are in effect uh, a symbol of unity. Uh, so I hope that we will able to watch this just one uh, uh, minute uh, video. Uh, it's in Ukrainian, but with uh, English uh, uh, subtitles. Uh, so uh, Elise, uh, maybe you could help me uh, to show it. Життя – це рух. Із переміщень все розпочинається. Коли у світ великий. Люди малі переміщаються. Дрібні напевні кроки, перші подолані відстані. Тоді я на роботу. В універ. І от ми всі вже переміщені. 
Та сталося так, що все життя... Ти за хвилину спакував у рюкзак. Коли з-під ніг іде земля, десь в глибині душі цікаво. Що залишається тобі? На що іще ти маєш право? Право на дружбу на будь-якій відстані від дому. Право на сльози. І на те, щоб не плакати самому. Це моє право. Допомагати щиро та доречно. І твоя ніковість зараз теж право, безперечно. З якого б міста ти не був, у нас єдина мрія. Та одні переконання. А ВПО насправді. Це великий приклад об'єднання. Thank you a lot for the attention. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And, uh, and that was an incredibly powerful uh, video as well as uh, intervention. We're behind time, so I won't comment on anything. Straight over to you, Antoine, from Humanity and, Humanity and Inclusion, um, to speak to your uh, operations in Colombia. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jima. So uh, I hope the presentation is uh, loaded now. You can see the screen. OK, thank you. So uh, I will present you um, what uh, humanity and inclusion uh, is working, uh, has worked in uh, Cauca, one of the department of Colombia, and more specifically uh, in the municipality of Corinto, where HI began humanitarian demining in 2017, uh, along with other sectors and approaches such as victim assistance and conflict transformation, with uh, all this uh, linked with strategies uh, of uh, community liaison officers. So this, uh, this that we have implemented allowed us to, uh, to reach uh, and to implement proactive uh, protection measures uh, with results that, goes, that uh, have been uh, beyond the uh, withdrawal of our organization uh, and uh, our land release activities. So here, the slide that I present to you is uh, the map of uh, HI intervention of Colombia today, uh, even if we are celebrating our 25th uh, uh, birthday, I will, I will say, in Colombia uh, this year. Uh, so in blue, the departments of intervention, uh, in, uh, just to put in context, so we are working on the migration crisis here in Colombia. Uh, and also on the internal conflict, the sectors of interventions are, relate, are related to sexual and reproductive health, mental health and psychosocial supports, uh, economic inclusion, uh, and all what is related uh, to uh, armed violence reduction, uh, including land release, risk education, uh, victim assistance uh, uh, that uh, we are working uh, in uh, Colombia now. So if we go a little bit deeper uh, in the in the map, in the in the contextualization, uh, so here uh, you can see uh, Cauca department, uh, which is on the uh, southwest of Colombia, uh, um, composed of indigenous and farmers community. These communities are um, living in rural areas of the department. It is a, a department that is highly affected by um, the, the internal conflict uh, due to its uh, geostrategic importance and access to the Pacific coast. There are a lot of illicit crops, uh, a lot, it is highly affected by drug trafficking and the presence of armed actors. There are also uh, quite often disputes between the different armed groups themselves, but also with the militaries. Uh, inducing uh, high-risk uh, dynamics for the living communities uh, and uh, resulting in a high contamination of explosive remnants of war. Uh, in the map on the left, um, the colors represent in red the municipalities that uh, are still needing to be uh, demined and orange under uh, process. And green, they are safe, free of, free of mines. So here uh, is a map of Cauca uh, on the left and uh, the department is divided into several uh, municipalities and the work of HI here was in Corinto uh, where there is a, the black uh, circle on the on the north of the of this department 
So here, Corinto map now, so you can see there are a lot of mountains. Uh, so in the north of uh, Cauca, uh, and again, um, many, many farmers and many indigenous communities living there, the majority of the people of this uh, municipality. Uh, so uh, regarding the land, so the, the, the land which is easily accessible uh, is uh, unsuitable for cultivation, is uh, really concentrated in the sugar mill uh, companies, while uh, the mountainous and difficult to access lands are in the hands of farmers and indigenous. Uh, and because of that, uh, and the difficulty of access to this land, uh, they not only have to share, but sometimes they have to dispute for the land. Uh, in the history, uh, for the last decades, um, the north of the Cauca, including Corinto municipality, uh, was uh, an area uh, controlled by the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Force Groups of Colombia. Uh, and uh, since 2017, with the start of demobilization process of the signing of the peace agreement in 2016, sorry, uh, this armed group uh, has progressively withdrew uh, of, the, of the municipality. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the territory uh, was gradually occupied by new armed groups uh, and they took control who took control of uh, so this was to put into context because it, it, it's quite complex uh, in uh, in Cauca uh, department. So in uh, what about HI in in this municipality? So as I said, we we were working in this municipality and we started. Uh, we had in 2016. Uh, we have been assigned to work on humanitarian demining uh, in this municipality uh, and basically in the mountainous area. Uh, so we started this activity uh, of humanitarian demining in 2017 and uh, one year later, uh, July 2018, uh, we managed to have an agreement between the farmers and the indigenous communities regarding the land dispute. So uh, the agreement was about a joint reactivation uh, and the use of a land for development of their communities. Uh, and this common project was to develop their own sugar mill uh, with a production alternative to illicit crops. Uh, so this was uh, the result of HI comprehensive approach to arm violence reduction. So combining risk education, land release, victim assistance, but also uh, with a plus uh, of the work with the community liaison strategy. Uh, and this has been possible thanks to the combination of various donors, uh, including Swiss Development Co uh, Cooperation, uh, which uh, Bridget is going to speak just after. Um, this strategy was not led by HI, uh, but uh, by the, the community agents themselves uh, from farmer and ind indigenous communities. Um, uh, and uh, what is also interesting here is that Within Corinto, the two communities and the agents has worked together uh, with, it, with farmers and with uh, indigenous, but also um, for the installation of the sugar mill and all the techniques that have been supported with another community from another municipality from Caribillo, uh, which is uh, a municipality of um, uh, hours distance from, uh, from Corinto. Uh, and this farmer community went and supported these two other communities of Corinto to implement this sugar mill. So this has been uh, uh, thanks to the, co the connection uh, within the community agents. Uh, today, what is the situation? So um, this was a quite long process at the end. Uh, and between uh, uh, the moments we started this process and now, uh, so uh, four or five years of intervention to organize all the process uh, with the communities for the operation of the, the of the mill of the sugar mill. Uh, the violence has escalated again uh, with the arrival of the new armed groups uh, that came to occupy the spaces left by the FARC. Uh, the confrontation between armed groups has intensified and HI unfortunately due to security reason had to withdraw uh, as a demining actor in Corinto. Uh, so during this time of escalate, escalating of the tension, uh, HI and the committee, we had to define an alternative strategy 
to anticipate the withdrawal of our organization, uh, focused on protection actions to allow the development of capacities in the management and prevention of the risks caused by the armed violence. Violence, sorry. So today, uh, there are good relations uh, between the farmers and the indigenous, um, uh, so they are maintained and they continue working on joint action to strengthen then their communities. Um, although we have to admit that the sugar mill is not providing a significant economic income, but it generates now products for daily consumption of the families, families involved and uh, the communities continue to strengthen themselves to maintain control of their territories. So this is uh, to conclude, uh, so the link with proactive protection. So um, HI uh, as an organi uh, organization is uh, always trying to have a armed violence reduction action as integral as possible. Uh, but it's not always uh, the case uh, because of the context, because of the stakeholder strategies. Uh, and uh, when we started to work uh, in uh, humanitarian demining in Corinto, it was uh, indeed not possible. The situation did not allow us to, to be as comprehensive as we wanted. But due to external factors, uh, including negative ones, uh, HI hand is we had to think about coping solutions to prevent risk related to armed violence. So at that time, uh, we were not conscious that it could be named proactive pre uh, prevention. Uh, and one of the options to mitigate these external risks was indeed to take advantage of the work with the community liaison agents um, going beyond strategy within each community, but between the communities themselves. And this is what was interesting also. Uh, so this mm -hmm. resulted in the project of the sugar mill. Sorry. Uh, we yeah. just got to wrap up. Yeah, Anton. Yeah, yeah, I'm, fi I'm finishing. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, I'm, um, look. so now, uh, what what we could say in the um, in the short term that we we the, the the methodology managed to interrupt the the land dispute between the communities, and we also manage uh, thanks to this uh, approach to reinforce uh, the land control toward external actors. So, still fragile but we managed to, 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 to move forward. And I think we, we still need to more investment to, to be reinforced and to disseminate, to disseminate this, uh, this uh, methodology. So I just stop here. Many thanks. And sorry, it's always hard towards an end of a session when you're running over to uh, wrap up on such interesting activities. Um, because of time, we'll go straight over to Brigitte Odelin from uh, Swiss Development Corporation, if you're there. Uh, Brigitte, um, do you want to come in now before we see yes, if we've got time for a quick question or two? Lovely, thank, thank you. you. Over yeah. to you. Um, we're a bit thank behind you. time, as you see, so we're yeah. trying to keep it as short as possible. Yeah, yeah, thanks. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to. So uh, first, I wanted to thank the organizers and all the participants. Um, as we have heard today, uh, interrupting violence is an important component of any protection strategy. It can save lives and it can contribute to reducing the number of people affected by violence. Um, we have heard many examples today of where this programming has been supported by donors. I am pleased that SDC is one of them, and we are excited about the opportunity to support our implementing partners to scale up this work. Um, there are several reasons why it remains challenging for donors to support this work at scale. Firstly, it is easier for us to support programs where the impact is clear. Um, we know that intuitively civilian self-protection, protection by presence, and other proactive protection approaches can make a difference. But we also know that it is difficult to measure and to demonstrate impact with preventive prevention work. Uh, we therefore encourage partners and the GPC to continue to find ways to show that this programming works. We have a lot of learning to draw from other fields, such as uh, public health. Secondly, we need more evidence. We've, we've, uh, we've heard great examples today. We still um, have to, to, to get more. We hope that the community-led task team will systematically document and share more examples to keep building the evidence base and to build confidence in more partners that this type of work is promising. 
We also know that we're all risk averse, I mean, donors, but also agencies, organization, and there are good reasons for that. One of the best ways to overcome the risk aversion might be to build a more solid evidence base. Um, it is, um, so we need to, to have a better documentation and sharing success stories with the donor community, but it would also be important to rigorously assess and evaluate promising programs before going to scale to explore whether this success would also be found in other contexts and to document the learnings that will enable you to adapt the programs for other settings. And lastly, we need to see these programs prioritized in country strategies. As the donor community, we rely on clusters to assess the needs and to identify the strategies that are most likely to be effective. We know that you are under pressure to find ways to reach people, more people with less. And we know that prevention is key to bringing down the number of people in need. So we will try to align our funding with the priorities that you, that you put forward. So if interrupting violence is a key component of your strategy, please make this explicit in, in your HRP, HRPs and protection strategies, and then identify the approaches that you think are most promising in your context. Lastly, we trust the GBC will uh, play a championing role to help to mobilize partners, consolidate the evidence, and keep us informed about what works and what needs further investment. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Brigitte. And because of time, I don't know if many will have uh, time to stay over for, your, for a few minutes, but I think that's a great entry point for to go over to Samuel Chung, uh, the head of the Global Protection Cluster. And perhaps, Sam, you can talk about sort of the role of the Global Protection Cluster um, in taking this forward in the more traditional humanitarian system and in a coordinated approach. But over to you for closing remarks. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, let me say, I mean, I am floored at and impressed uh, at the diversity of, of and the promising practices that we've heard from uh, all of our presenters today. It's a perfect launch to this uh, protection conversation series uh, that we've begun with the GPC, which once again exemplifies the variety of expertise in every country and continent around the world uh, that makes up and comprises this community that we call protection together. Uh, it's not just information sharing, but it's also mutual encouragement, identification of good practices, and really advancing on protection uh, together. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, Gemma, for 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 facilitating this, but uh, particularly to Tiffany, to Carolina, Danielle, uh, Huibert, Natalia, Antoine, and Brigitte also for your very, very uh, encouraging words there from the donor side. Uh, really, really impressive stuff, and we co commend you on all of that. Uh, on my side, maybe just two or three quick remarks to close. Um, First is just to say uh, from the Global Protection Cluster side, we, we re reiterate the importance of this topic, this concept, this objective uh, as that of the of the protection cluster and, and looking really at this idea of pro proactive protection. I mean, I looked it up on the dictionary here again and proactive and what does proactive mean? It means creating or controlling a situation rather than just responding to it after it has happened. And I think to me that speaks very well to one of the challenges that we have across clusters, which is prioritization. And that's I heard that also from Brigitte here in terms of how this is prioritized. And this is about us identifying where we can create control situations as well. The other call is for us to be closer to the front lines, uh, really around where protection risks and threats occur uh, to prevent violence from happening, to reduce, mitigate its impacts. And again, once again, I think this concept, this objective, uh, this practice uh, really brings us there. And we heard that today from from such a variety of speakers. Uh, so from my side, just in, in terms of objective and also enthusiastically, I'd like to endorse this concept as one that is critically important for protection clusters and really reflects the direction that we are we are heading today. But with, with two important reflections that I've heard from from you and the presenters uh, today, one of them again is around this issue of 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 um, I think it was we bear you said it. The biggest atrocities are the most difficult and dangerous to address sometimes, right? Uh, it, but at the same time, we have to recognize where there are the opportunities as well as some of the other risks and threats, which is some are at times around the periphery of that those kind of the front lines, the harder issues, and just a recognition uh, that you know sh when addressing where the opportunities are for impact 
some of them are, as you mentioned, types of these situations, uh, the, 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 the brief ces ceasefires or cessations of hostilities, the mutual agreement between parties around, uh, around um, interrupting violence for, 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 uh, for some, for, for either remedial uh, or, or other responsive measures. This is a, a clearly an area, and I think building on what Brigitte has said from the donor community, but also in our humanitarian response planning, could be more clearly res uh, identified, prioritized, articulated, and reflected in our cluster response strategies. That's almost, I'd have to say that it is exactly what we need also in some cluster responses is that identification of where can we make that impact. Uh, we know the biggest atrocities are there, but there's also, uh, you know, at the local level, at different areas, opportunities to make real gains in terms of response, uh, prevention, mitigation, etc. So I think that really me meets a need for us for clusters on the ground. The second is on this is aspect of being on the front lines, and it is again we are pushing. It is it is difficult. We know there are access constraints, uh, but we need to hone in on where the front lines of conflict, where the front lines of violence are affecting people on the ground. And for us, it's not only just the military front lines, but it's also the front lines in communities. I don't know if we call them micro front lines, but you know these fracture points where risks and threats occur at community levels are also front lines uh, where we can make an impact. And I, I really appreciated that also reflection. There are so many gains, and we've, we heard it right here in all the various examples of where we can interrupt violence, where we can uh, uh, open space for protection responses. So with that, again, just enthusiasm basically endorse uh, and 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 am encouraged by by these. From the GPC side, uh, we are happy to champion this and, and move forward uh, with this. It resonates with a number of our overall priorities. It resonates with our access that protects agenda for change, noting that access is about protection, that access requires sustainable uh, access, quality access that also means presence, presence where it counts presence uh, along the front lines, et cetera. And also it really hones in well with our uh, with our newly established uh, task team on community-led protection, which I really, really hope not only looks at the, the enabling the capacities of communities, but really enabling their capacities around this particular issue of self-protection, of where the opportunities are at engagement among communities. And once again, from Colombia to Afghanistan to others, we've seen those examples uh, loud and clear from all of you. So uh, just from our side, we're, we're ready to champion this forward. We're very thankful also for all of you for participating in this conversation series, because this is exactly where we get to identify these promising areas of work, as well as so that we can all forge on together. So thank you very much. And, and Gemma, I'll hand back to you for the final words. Thanks for that so much, Sam, and uh, for all of you for staying on for a few minutes. I think this has been a really rich discussion um, and great to hear that the Global Protection Cluster will champion this. Um, and I think, as I said at the beginning, this is already a contribution to a growing community of practice. Um, we at HPG are also collaborating with a number of organisations, uh, including on the line, um, to look at sort of ways to, to take this forward. So thanks again to all panellists. Um, thanks very much for everyone for um, um, for listening today and I think it's a watch this space on there uh, on you know sort of seeing what emerges from some of these conversations it's really exciting to see where they go um, so thanks very much uh, have a good evening um, for all of you see you